بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ونواله أما بعد. So today's lecture is a rather interesting one, uh, and it is one that doesn't have any uh, particular, if you like, general uh, introduction to history. That's simply too much. It's entitled Lessons from History, and what I wanted to shed some light on is to answer the question that a lot of us had, and we've had references to this, of the rise and fall of the Islamic Ummah, uh, the political rise and fall. Let's be very frank here, that our Ummah, once upon a time, was an intellectual powerhouse. It was at the cutting edge of civilization. It was admired and respected by the entire world. And this is a fact that nobody can deny, that never before in human history had a civilization basically been a global civilization from Andalusia to China, like the Muslim Empire. And never before had we reached the peaks of scientific development, of literature, of arts, of, of calligraphy, as we had in the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th centuries. Of course, now the whole situation is reversed. And we now are suffering economic crises. We are at the bottom of the development scale, the human, uh, uh, the, 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 what is it called, the World Development Index, or the Human Development Index, that lang ranks the countries that are the most uh, livable and the best. The top 50 countries, there's only two or three Muslim countries in the 40s and 50s. Right? The top 50 countries has two or three, Kuwait and UAE and the oil-rich countries, they're numbering in the 40s in terms of livability and health care and education and all of this. So a question that we need to ask ourselves, what happened? Why? Why this reversal? And there's no doubt that this question cannot be answered in one lecture, much less a lecture of an evening. This is a question that has many dissertations, many PhDs, many volumes written. But what I wanted to do was to shed light on one particular aspect and to weave our way through 13 centuries to get a brief introduction of the change of mindset of how Muslims were and then how they became through the development of one technology and that is the technology of paper and eventually the printing press. So just to shed some light about how Muslims were and how they evolved and no doubt before we even get to the issue of paper and how Muslims received it, before we even get to there, the question of why the Muslims rose and why they fell can be answered generically with two causes, spiritual and worldly, very generically. They rose to the power that they were because of their Iman and because they embraced the modern world and they embraced all that it had to offer. And then they fell because of their lack of Iman and also because they failed to keep up with the times, right? In our times, we have two groups of intellectuals, usually the religious class on one side and the um, progressive class or the more academically inclined on the other. And they try to analyze the rise and fail only by one of these two. So usually when you hear the khatib on the mimbar, he's going to say, He's going to quote you the verse, Allah does not change the situation of a people until they change themselves. All we have to do is to be better Muslims. And if we're better Muslims and we have more iman and taqwa and we come to the masjid, we will rise up again. I beg to differ and I say that's one of the two causes. Right? On the other extreme, we have those who generally are not religiously inclined. Generally, they're not the ones emphasizing Iman and Taqwa and Tahajjud and Salah. And they're saying, we rose because we led the Renaissance and we had the Golden Age and we discovered the sextant and the, and the, the, the globe and the spheres and this and that. And we charted out the skies and we knew this and that. We, we mapped out the whole world and we discovered America. And so they, just, they have this entire intellectual history, right? And the Golden Age for them is that of Andalusia. Where all the cultures mix, scientific achievements were at their, at their zenith. And they say when the Muslims stopped this and they turned their back to civilization, the decline began. And for them, there's no question of Iman and Taqwa. It doesn't come on the equation. Spirituality has nothing to do with it. right? Now, I again beg to differ with them as well. And the easiest way to differ with them is to point out that the single most successful generation was that of the Sahaba. And the Sahaba conquered more land than any future generation. Yet they were technologically the least in terms of later generations. And they were civilizationally, they hadn't reached that pinnacle 
as Andalusia had reached. But because of their iman, and also I would add, because of their willingness to engage with modernity of their time, with their willingness to adapt, they did manage to go where they went. So these are two generic causes, spirituality and deen and dunya basically, right? The world and your religion. I don't want to emphasize in today's lecture the religious side. I do that a lot in the khutbahs and I fully agree that that is the more important. And I fully agree that we need to emphasize our iman and taqwa before we jump to the sciences. I fully agree. I just wanted to point out that it is also true to say that the Muslims' inquisitiveness and the Muslims' embrace of the modernity of their time was an important factor. And eventually their shutting off of this door and their close-mindedness to change became a cause of their failure as well. And we're going to discuss this very briefly, inshallah ta'ala, very briefly in a nutshell, discussing the rise, the advent, the pro pro proliferation of paper, and then what the Muslims did with that, and then what the Muslims did with the second inven invention, and that is that of the printing press. So, let us begin by talking about paper. What is paper? Paper is a substance without which we cannot imagine our lives. Paper is a substance that we write on, we print on. There is more paper printed today. Uh, it is said that if all the paper of the world were to be uh, laid out flat, it would cover the whole world multiple times over. And there is more paper printed today after the age of the internet than before. A lot of people think that the internet is, uh, is, is, is uh, the demise of printing and paper. In fact, the opposite is true. That research has shown that there's more paper printed post-internet than pre-internet. And of course, paper is the single most useful material to write on, far more useful than anything that was used before paper. Paper was invented by the Chinese. It wasn't invented by the Muslims. Around 100 uh, CE. And... Uh, the Chinese only used it for very specific purposes. Apparently, they didn't, it didn't click upon them the utility of paper. They used it primarily for fanciful artwork. They didn't use it for bureaucracy. It didn't become a staple usage of the Chinese empire. And so the Chinese kept it a trade secret. They didn't proliferate paper, and it was a guild. Whoever wanted to learn the art of paper making had to join this guild and only if you are part of the guild would you be taught how to make paper it didn't become a public knowledge it was a private enterprise and it remained this way for the next three four hundred years of course up until that time the, th the things that people used to write on were stones and rocks were Bones were papyrus papyrus had been invented by the Egyptians and papyrus was the most common commonly used material in Mesopotamia. But in Arabia, when the Qur'an came down, papyrus was very difficult to get a hold of. When the Qur'an came down, the primary material that the Muslims used were uh, leaves that came from the, uh, the date palms, which they made a type of papyrus out of. Not as good as Egyptian, but they had some type of basic material of making this parchment of leaf. And they also used shoulder bones of camels. Camels have large shoulder bones. So they would write on this. They would also use the leather of camels. Now, what's the problem of using leather and, 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 and uh, things made out of, of leaves? Who can tell me what's the problem with this? It's going to decompose very fast, number one. Number two? Smell? <laughs> okay. I don't think they really were bothered about that. They used to live in houses made out of dung sometimes, right? They weren't really bothered about that. But what else? The volume, the size. And we have copies of the Qur'an written on leather. Uh, and you have pictures, you can Google it. Uh, I wanted to make a PowerPoint, but I didn't have time. I just got back yesterday, as you know. Uh, you can Google it. A copy of the Qur'an written in the first 50 years, it is, and I kid you not, almost as big as this table. That high, this high, and bigger than this table in width, and three quarters of this table in length. This is a Qur'an that we have from around 60 or 70 Hijra, an entire Qur'an in Egypt, and it is written on leather. Now can you imagine every paper is a leather skin, how much is going to be there, right? So a Qur'an that big, this is not a personal copy. When the Abu Bakr wrote the Qur'ans, he wrote them on camel leather. And we can imagine that that Qur'an would have been bigger than two and a half, three feet in width. Lengthwise, four or five feet, and widthwise as well. So this is massive Quran. This is what this is what leather is going to do for the time. So 
this was what the Quran was written on. Because the earliest copies of the Quran were written on parchment and leather, hardly any copies of this period have come down to us because it decomposes. Very rare. We hardly have any copies of the Quran in its entirety from the first 50 years of the Hijrah. We have bits and pieces, parchments, fragments. We have the things here and there. But we hardly have a complete Quran. In fact, to be academically honest, we don't have a complete Quran that's written down in the first 60 years of the Hijrah. The first Quran is around 70, 80 that we have in our hands. Why? Because uh, anything written on leather will decompose. Just like skin is going to decompose. So, paper is very different. Paper does not decompose. Another major importance of paper is that, generally speaking, paper absorbs ink far more permanently. Unlike leather. Leather, all they had to do when they wanted to reuse the letter was to put it in water for a few hours or a day, and then take it out and let it dry, and they could reuse the letter all over again. right? And so one of the ways to destroy a book was to put it in water. Whereas in our times, paper, of course, the paper will ruin the water, but the ink will still be on there. Right? So paper also absorbs the ink better. Now, getting back to the topic at hand. When did the Muslims first come across paper? There was a small, insignificant battle between the Muslims and uh, the Chinese forces in 751 CE. 751 CE, the early Abbasid period. And this battle is very insignificant politically. And it is hardly mentioned in the books of the time, because it's a small battle, skirmish. But it changed the entire course of humanity afterwards because of the discovery of paper. The battle is known as the Battle of Tal'as in 751 CE. The Battle of Tal'as, and it took place in what is now Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan. And in this battle, the Muslims conquered uh, a small area of uh, the Han Dynasty, and they took prisoners of war, and they discovered that two of the prisoners of war were from this guild of paper manufacturing society. Two of the prisoners of war were from this secret guild, meaning that they wouldn't teach it publicly. You had to be a part of the guild. And of course, the Muslims had seen paper in China because people are using it. And now that they found out that these two prisoners were the people who knew how to make paper, they sent these prisoners of war under armed guard back to the Khilafah, back to Baghdad, right? Unlike the other prisoners, there was ransomed off, sold, whatnot. These two prisoners are extra special. They have the VVIP treatment, right? They're sent back under armed guard to the, 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 the capital. And there, the Sultan or the Khalifa finds out that these are paper manufacturers. So he says, instead of any ransom, instead of any money, you have to teach us the art of paper making and you shall be set free. We find here a willingness to acquire knowledge from non-Muslims and to then implement it. The Khalifa, just like the Prophet ﷺ before him a century ago, understood the importance of knowledge. Remember in the Battle of Badr when the Prophet ﷺ, uh, had prisoners of war who could read and write, what did he do? He said, instead of any money, I want every one of you to teach 10 of our kids how to read and write. Isn't this a well-known thing? In the Battle of Badr, he said, instead of any money, you guys, reading and writing was very rare. You guys, instead of any money, forget the money. We have something far more important than money. We have the knowledge of reading and writing. We want you to teach it to our kids. Teach 10 of our kids and you will be freed. And so the Prophet ﷺ did this. A century later, the Khalifa in Baghdad said the same thing. You have this knowledge, teach it to us and you shall be set free. And eventually, slowly but surely, paper then began to spread in Baghdad and then in Samarkand, and it began to supplant papyrus and other materials that was being used. And by the way, we hardly have any remains of ancient manuscripts in papyrus, because papyrus erodes away. We have fragments of the Muwatta of Imam Malik and of the Seerah of Ibn Hisham uh, written on papyrus pages here and there in Paris, in London, we have certain fragments, but we don't have a single ancient book of papyrus because papyrus doesn't last. With the advent of paper, of course, all of this is about to change. And therefore, during the reign of Al-Mansur in 754 to 775, this was Al-Mansur, one of the early Abbasid Khalifas, Al-Mansur decreed that the entire bureaucracy, the Dawawin, the registers, would change from papyrus to paper. We're now going to use paper for all government transactions and business dealings. All records are going to be on 
paper. Therefore, in around 770 or so, the entire Muslim lands uh, began trans transcribing uh, taxes and quotas and ratio, everything to do with the government. All government registrars, the Dawawin, the Dawawin of taxes and kharaj, the Dawawin of zakah, the Dawawin of uh, uh, lands, of governors, of in uh, correspondence, all of this changed into paper from papyrus and therefore the Muslims needed to manufacture their own paper and from for this purpose the first paper manufacturing plant was set up first in Samarkand and then in Baghdad the first paper manu manufacturing plant outside of China ever was taken and transformed by the Arabs in Baghdad and in Samarkand and uh, it is said that uh, Harun al-Rashid was one of those who popularized paper. At that time, it was called uh, Kaghad, Kaghad, from the Persian Kaghaz, which is Urdu to this day, Kaghaz. And this Persian word comes from the uh, ancient Chinese word, which I don't know how to pronounce, but it's written as Kaghaz, so I don't know how to pronounce it. But there's a Chinese word that is this paper. So the word Kaghad, which is still Urdu, Kaghaz, we call it to this day. And, and Arabs still, they know, classical Arabs, they know Kaghad is how they would pronounce a paper. It actually comes from Chinese. So this shows us that the influence that the Chinese had on Muslims, later on we're going to see an Arabic word that came into English, we'll get there. But just by words we have an indication of where ideas came from. The word for paper is in fact Chinese. And that is Kaghad. Now the Muslims understood the significance of paper. And paper revolutionized knowledge completely. And one of the few people who, who pointed this out was Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun is the first social historian. He's the first person to analyze the rise and fall of nations from a sociological perspective. And he is known as the father of sociology even in Western worlds. Ibn Khaldun wrote, this is many hundreds of years later, thus, during the reign of Harun Rashid and before him the Mansur, thus, paper was introduced for government documents and diplomas. Afterwards, people used sheets of paper for scholarly writings. And paper and the manufacture of paper reached a considerable degree of excellence. So people understood. Now what is paper? Paper is an engine for social change, for intellectual change, for artistic change. The presence of paper signifies what? Literacy. It signifies education. It signifies therefore, what does education signify? Productivity, intellectual genius, scientific inquiry, uh, Islamic scholarship. All of this is synonymous with paper. And therefore when Muslims embraced paper, the Islamic revolution of thoughts and ideas sparked off. And they began doing many things. Islamic scholarship, writing books, translating the books of the ancient Greeks. And this led to, as we all know, the initial Islamic renaissance, if you like, the Islamic uh, flourishing of sciences. And as a footnote, it's interesting that there were many types of paper at the time. Depending on the people who invented them and the people who patronized them, we had uh, Suleimani paper, we had Ahmadi paper, uh, we had uh, Nurani paper. Right? Uh, all of these are different types of papers. You, depending on what paper you wanted, these were all Islamic names. A very interesting point, many people don't know this. When Muslims uh, acquired paper, the, the art of made, making paper, they did two things. Firstly, they developed a new process from the Chinese processes. And I already said they had their own types of paper. Nurani and, and, and Ja'fari, there is a Ja'fari paper, I'm not inventing uh, this. There's a Ja'fari paper named after Ja'far, the guy who invented it. And there's different types of paper. Uh, now, they took the, te uh, the technology that the Chinese gave them and they took paper making to a whole new level. And they made paper, basically proliferated it throughout the entire Islamic lands. The Chinese hadn't done that. The manufacturing was still very primitive and it was secretive and elitist. The Muslims made it popular in an entire region. That's the first thing they did. The second thing they did, very interesting here, the Chinese and everybody before them, anytime they had papyrus, how do you, what do you do with papyrus? How do you, how do you store it? Tell me, what, is, what do you do when you have a papyrus? You write a long thing, what do you do then? Roll exactly, you roll it up, right? And this was what the Chinese would do with their ancient papers as well. Because papyrus automatically rolls up. So they would just roll it up and put it in a, a box or something. Now paper doesn't roll. So Muslims are now producing a lot of paper, writing books. Therefore the Muslims began stacking sheets of paper together. And they decided to start binding from the side. 
Never before had paper been bound from the side. And they would sew together uh, uh, what they called, I'm getting jumping the gun here, what do you call a whole stack of papers? A stack of papers is called a ream. A ream of papers. The word ream comes from the Arabic word. An Arabic word that means bundle. A ream of papers, it comes from, the Arabic word is rizma. So they dropped the zine and so they made it a ream. The word ream comes from rizma. So they started putting papers stacked together and they started binding the rizma and they started binding it from one side and then when you have a bound stack of papers from one side, what do you need? You need a cover. So they took what is now cardboard, but back then they used leather or other things. They made a harder thing and they made a binding around the, the ream. And they had a, uh, a, a marker. You know, you still have Qur'ans printed like this, that one side is bound, the other flap of the Qur'an is just simply a triangular curve like this, right? They had a marker that they would use to mark how much they had read. And so the, basically what I'm trying to say is, the modern notion of a book was developed in Muslim lands when paper flourished. The, the structure of a book was something that the Muslims developed. And in fact, when they would put this binding and they would have a harder structure on the side of the book, because you know when you have lots of these things stacked up, you don't know what's what. What did they start doing? They, write it, they started writing the name of the book on the cover, on the binding. Right? And therefore, when you, ha when you see the modern structure of the book, this is taken completely from the Muslim minds of the 9th and 10th centuries. That this is how they would write their books and bind them together and have a cover and write the cover or write the name of the book on the cover and on the side. So that when you stack all of the books together, in those days they would stack them bottom up, not like in our times. Uh, they would stack them bottom up. When you have all the books stacked up, you could see which book is what. And to this day, the structure of the book and putting the name and the binder, all of this has been basically inherited from the Muslim minds of the 8th and 9th centuries. Now, look at now, at this stage, the Muslims are, their minds are just abuzz, right? They're willing to embrace change. They're, they're, they're embracing a technology that was not theirs. They better it, and then they change the world uh, because of it. Um, and the Western world at this time has no clue what paper is. The Western world is, of course, they're in the dark ages. They can't even read and write at this time, right? The Muslims have reached their pinnacle. Uh, as a side point, this is when, of course, the whole scientific uh, uh, inquiry begins in Islamic lands, when uh, Greek works are translated, when uh, achievements in chemistry and physics and in biology and medicine, all of this is occurring uh, simultaneously. And as I said, the medium of paper had a lot to do with that, because without paper, you're not going to have these books that are spreading to all of these Muslim lands. Now, eventually, the, the Western world is introduced to paper. And it's introduced in two, three different ways. One of the first introductions comes during the Crusades. In 1096, there are nine Crusades. The first one of them is when they conquered uh, Jerusalem. And this is one of the first interactions between Europe and the Muslim lands. You have to realize this is before globalization. You know, the average person, was it 97, 98% of people who are born, born uh, they are born and they die in the same city that their parents have been born and died in and then with those before them. People don't travel in this time. They are in, within their own little spheres. There's no interaction. The first crusades was one of the first interactions of Europe with Islam. And that has set the stage for many other interactions, right? When Europe invaded Muslim lands unprovoked, without any reason, and they caused one of the biggest massacres in medieval times where they killed perhaps half a million, 750,000 Muslims, men, women, and children in Jerusalem. The streets were flowing with blood. This is the first crusade. In this crusade, a lot of things happened. One of them was the European discovery of paper. When they come across Muslim lands and they acquire uh, all of these things, they see Muslims have books, they have scientific achievements, they have learning, and they have paper. So they bring paper back, but they don't know how to make it. It's exotic, it's, it's, it's fancy, but they don't know how to make it. Uh, one of the first times that they figured out how to make it, there's two simultaneous regions that were under Muslim land, but they were reconquered by the Western world. The first of these is known to all of you, and that is... Spain, Andalusia, right? Andalusia. The re, it's called the Reconquista. The Reconquista is the reconquering. The Reconquista began in 1086. 
Uh, and uh, therefore it's very similar to the time the first crusades also began. The Reconquesta began in northern Andalusia with the cities of Toledo and other cities. And as they reconquered these Muslim lands, they acquired the technological advancements that the Muslims had done, and therefore, not a coincidence, one of the first paper mills in modern Europe was acquired in northern Andalusia from a city that's not far from Toledo that is called Yativa. It is called Yativa. It's close to the modern city of Murcia. And this is in around 1151. So one of the first paper mills was acquired by the Reconquesta, by the army of uh, the Spaniards, when they acquired the Muslim city and they found these libraries and they found paper mills. They didn't have the heart to destroy the paper mills. This is technology. And so they let the paper mills remain and it is also a historic fact that every time they conquered cities, they forced all the Muslims to leave or they killed them, but they always kept a handful of Muslims. Those who knew the trades. They kept some sea builders, they kept some manufacturers, and they kept the paper manufacturers as well. Because they didn't know how to make paper. So, of the few families that were forced to remain and work under labor, under slave labor conditions, uh, they were spared their lives and their property uh, for a generation. Then, then they killed them anyway, or they called them to exile. But for a generation or two, a few Muslim families were spared. And of those Muslim professions who were spared were paper manufacturers, because the Christians didn't know how to make paper. This is the first area that was reconquered uh, by, uh, by Europe, by Christians, and to this day, of course, it is, uh, uh, has been lost by the Muslim lands. There is also another area which is not that well known. People don't really think about it. But in some ways, it had an even more pronounced effect on Europe. And that is, um, no, not in Europe, Timbuktu is not Europe, on Africa. Anybody? No, that's 1453. We're way, way beyond. And Muslims conquered Constantinople the other way around. Sicily. Sicily, very good. Sicily. Sicily. Sicily is far more important to Europe because Andalusia is far away. Where is Andalusia and where is, where is the heartland of Europe? Right? But Sicily is right next door to, in, in fact, it is modern Italy. Right? Sicily is a small island, right off of the coast of Italy. And of course, Sicily and Italy have very strong ties, the same language, the same culture. Uh, you know, it's, like, it's basically the same territory. In our times, of course, it is, uh, it is the same political domain. Now, Sicily was under Muslim rule for over 200 years. Just like Cyprus and other small islands, Muslims control Cyprus as well. Cyprus also was lost to the Muslims, uh, but that was more recent. Sicily was also one of the early lands that was, that was lost. Now. Sicily has a far more pronounced impact overall on the Renaissance and on the formation of the medieval European mind. Because Roger the first, uh, let me look up the date here, Roger the first in 10, in 10, I can't find it in my papers, but 1072, I found it, 1072. In 1072, Roger the first reconquered Sicily from the Muslims. But Roger I was far more sympathetic than his Spanish counterparts. In fact, he spoke Arabic, he kept many of the ministers, uh, and Roger I introduced many changes that have a direct impact on the Renaissance, on the formation of the medieval European mind, and of them was also the introduction of paper. And so paper was introduced from two places. Well, three. The first was the, the, the Crusades, but not the manufacture of paper. The two places where they figured out how to make paper from the Muslims was number one, uh, uh, Andalusia, and number two, Sicily. And so the first printing, not printing press, we're not, sorry, there are no printing presses, sorry. The first paper mills, printing press is still 200 years down the line. The first paper mills of Europe are in Andalusia and in, where else? Sicily. And therefore, from Sicily, the art of making paper spread to Italy. And Italy took this technology from the Muslims, and like every smart civilization and, and, and intellectual culture, they adopted and they tinkered with it and they made it better and better and better. And in Italy, they introduced a type of manufacturing procedure that was unknown to Muslims, primarily because they took advantage of the many uh, rivers and the many water uh, tributaries that they had to introduce water mills. You know those things you see in Denmark and Holland, like basically the power of river, water running, 
right? The Muslim didn't have this in Middle Arabia. There are no rivers running through. The Europeans took advantage of the plenty, plentiful rivers that they have, and they manufactured a new technology to beat the pulp out with stronger uh, power from these water mills and to process it finer and to make a better quality paper. And so, slowly but surely, the Europeans began to make thinner, more durable, higher quality paper than Muslims. We see the tide shifting now, right? Once upon a time, paper is exclusively produced in Muslim lands. The rest of the world has no idea. Even the Chinese, far behind, nobody knows Chinese paper in 7th, 8th, 9th century. Nobody knows it. By the 10th and 11th centuries, uh, the Europeans acquired manufacturing processes from the Muslims. By the 12th and 13th, they are competing. By the 14th, they're making better paper than the Muslims. And by the beginning of the 14th century, Unbelievably, paper from Europe is being exported, where? To Muslim lands. We have a copy of the Qur'an written. Uh, now, another thing that the Europeans did, and again, there's no denying this, that the Muslims did the same 600, 500 years ago. They took the knowledge from the Chinese, from the, uh, from the ancient Greeks, from the Romans, they used the minds Allah gave them, and then... They took it to the stars, right? Well, the Europeans did the same thing. They took the knowledge, the technology from the Muslims. They used the minds Allah gave them. And once again, they upped the ante. They made technology far better than it was. One of the things the Europeans did was to uh, put a water mark on paper. That every manufacturing mill, and to this day, any fancy paper that you buy, not the ones here you get this paper, no. Any fancy paper that you buy, you look at and you look at it into the light, what do you see? A watermark, right? This was introduced in Italy in the 13th century. Now, what this means is that any paper produced in Europe after 1300 has a, a watermark, right? Whereas in Muslims, they didn't, they didn't do this. Now, because the Europeans had better manufacturing processes, they had better equipment, better plants. And therefore, we can track where paper originates from anywhere in Europe, what year, what batch, what printing uh, not printing, sorry, what manufacturing uh, plant has produced the paper. By 1400, we find that more and more Islamic books are being written on European paper. And I have seen myself at Yale, many Islamic, Yale has a lot of Islamic manuscripts, and we had a class on manuscripts at Yale, and my professor showed me, like, the first thing you do is you take a manuscript and you took it up in the light and you see the date and the place where the paper was made. Because by 16, 1700, all top quality paper is coming from Europe. And the Muslim paper manufacturing mills have almost collapsed. And this is an indication of what's about to happen now, right? This is an indication of what's about to happen. I said there's a, there a beautiful copy of the Quran uh, written in around 13, uh, 1340 or so, and it was, we still have it uh, in our times, it's in the Nasir Khalidi collection, a very famous collection, an entire beautiful calligraphy. And the whole Quran is written on Italian paper. 1340, they wanted to make a very good copy of the Quran, and they want the best paper. What paper do they buy? Italian paper. Because their own Muslim paper plants are not as good. And really the sad, disheartening thing is that the Italians, of course, are of course hardcore Catholics and Christians. So their watermark, their printing always has a cross in every single stamp. So the Quran is being written right on paper that has watermarks full of crosses. But this is the reality of the times. And this is again a sign of what's about to happen by the 15th century. Almost all manuscripts that we have in Muslim lands are written on Italian paper or on European paper. And by the 16th century, the art of paper manufacturing almost disappears from Muslim lands. There's just no point because you have better quality and cheaper paper coming from Europe. So what's going to happen to Muslim, Muslim paper manufacturing plants? Completely sizzle out and die. And so by 1600 onwards, there is no paper being produced in Muslim lands except as a hobby, except as here and there. But in terms of mass production, all the paper is coming out of Europe, being exported. So Europe has taken over, has taken over the paper manufacturing uh, industry. Now, with all this paper coming, 
And when you have a commodity for cheap, what happens? You need to figure out how to utilize it, what to do with it. With all this paper coming, European thinkers are now beginning to think, what can we do with all this paper? And it is not a coincidence that with the proliferation of paper, Johannes Gutenberg comes along, right? Along with his business partner, Andreas Heilmann, Andreas Heilmann, not a coincidence, not many of you know this, was in fact a paper manufacturing owner. He's got a lot of paper, he wants something to do with it, right? And all of this technology, all this come from the Muslims, so Gutenberg comes along, and he's a genius, no doubt about that, and he begins to think about what to do with this, and what does he come across, what does he invent? The modern printing press, right? Instead of sitting down and writing page by page, Gutenberg said, why don't we reverse the letters on this page, make a stamp out of it, and put all of these little letters reversed on a little block, a square block, right? And then stamp it with ink, take a paper, stamp the paper. And we mass produce the same book over and over and over again. There is no question that the printing press is one of the most important discoveries of mankind, ranking along with the discovery of the wheel and maybe like sliced cheese or something like that, you know? I mean, one of the most important discoveries of mankind is the printing press. It changed everything. And there's no question that this is a, uh, a European invention. Some people try to find links with ancient China, with even some Muslim practices of stamping. But, I mean, let's be honest here. The idea of mass printing and producing a book is something that nobody has ever done before uh, when Gutenberg came along and he invented the, uh, the printing press. And it is impossible to imagine the success of the printing press without paper. If you had to write on leather you wouldn't have a printing press. Leather is very, size varies. It's too finicky and you can't, you can't print ink on it the same way. It's too expensive to mass produce. It's simply impossible to imagine the printing press without the Muslim basically invention or the Muslim discovery of uh, paper. And so within a few decades after Gutenberg, there's an explosion of printing presses all over Europe. By the turn of the century, 300 European cities have printing presses, i.e. by 14, by 1500, by 1500, 300 European cities have printing presses. By the late 1500s, 20 million copies of books had sold. Now this is in a civilization that 100 years ago didn't know how to read and write. This is in a civilization that 100 years ago, the Catholic Church would kill you if you owned a science book. Right? You all know this time. But with the coming of the printing press, everything changes. And what's going to happen when you can spread a science book, a work of ethics, a work of philosophy, a work of anything? What's going to happen when you can mass produce it and distribute it 20, 30, 50,000 copies? The population becomes what? More and more educated. Right? More and more inquiring minds. Newton comes along in, in 15, what is it, 20 or something, and he produces his scientific book, The Scientific Inquiry. Dante comes along. Uh, all of these people come along, and they mass produce their books. And by mass producing their books, the educational level of a society goes higher and higher and higher. Everybody can read now, uh, 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 if you like, Newton, everybody can read uh, Hume or all of these intellectual thinkers of the 16th century. Now, Columbus, as you know, discovered America. He actually got lost. He thought he discovered India. He discovered America around this time. And within a generation of Columbus, printing presses were established in Mexico City and in other North American regions. That's how the Europeans understood. They're conquering this, this, this native population, but they understand the need to bring printing presses from Europe into these uncivilized backward lands and to set them up. We had printing presses in Mexico in around 1500 or so. What's happening in the Muslim world? Here is where the decline has already begun. Now the closing of the mines happens. What's happening in the Muslim world? Well, remember the printing press was discovered or invented in 1436. It's already in Mexico. It's already all over European lands. Within 20 years, the Muslims began hearing about this new invention. And they see copies of these books that just appear magically and miraculously. Once upon a time, what did they do with new inventions? They embraced it, they adopted it, and they made it better. But we now find the tide is changing. We now find the Muslim psyche, the Muslim mindset, 
is undergoing its own revolution. When the Muslims first discovered the printing press, the first thing they did, they banned it. And in 1485, the Ottoman Khalifa, Sultan Bayezid II, declared under the guise, I mean the ulama all supported him in this, all the scholars, everybody supported him, declared the printing press to be haram. And he said that it is not allowed to import the printing press into Muslim lands. And he said no books that were printed in Europe can be imported. Not just the printing press, even books that were printed in Europe cannot be imported into Ottoman lands. Surely this is just a strange fatwa within 5-10 years people reversed. Quite the contrary. 1515, one of his descendants, Sultan Salim I, when the printing press is becoming more and more powerful, when 20 million books have been sold, 20 million is a huge number by the way, for 1500, think about it, 20 million books have been sold in Europe, 1515, Sultan Salim I issues a decree. What is the decree? Wallahi, you will not believe this. I'm not inventing this up, look this up. Sultan Salim I issues a decree. Anybody who is caught with a printing press in any Ottoman land shall be executed. The penalty is death to own a printing press. And to own a book that's printed has its own hefty fines and I don't know, whippings, lashings, whatnot. Basically, it is, it is not just haram and kufr, it's murd, you're ridda, you're murtad, basically. Right? If you own a printing press, yani you are going to be executed. And execution is a punishment for murder, for rape, for highway robbery, and owning a printing press. Right? Notice the change of mindset now. It was blasphemous. You can't have anything to do with the printing press. Eventually, uh, 1492, the, the, what happens in 1492? Granada Falls, huge influx of Jews into Ottoman lands. The Jews petition the Sultan. We had printing presses in Andalusia. Allow us to have printing presses here. So the Sultan says, okay, fine, just for you guys, in your language, for your people, don't sell to the Muslims. So the Jews and then the Christians get private printing presses that they use to educate their people. And it is not a coincidence that in Ottoman lands, the most educated bureaucratic class were Jews and Christians. The doctors and engineers were generally Jews and Christians. The physicians were almost always Christians. Right? It's not a coincidence where you have education. This is unlike 500 years ago when Ibn Sina is ruling the world in medicine. Now things are changing now. Right? And the average Jew or Christian is way upper middle class because they have the education, they have the scientific background that is being deprived of Muslims. It is because of this ban that the first books printed in Arabic, the first Qur'ans printed were not printed in Muslim lands. The first Qur'ans ever printed were printed by non-Muslims for non-Muslims. Because the Muslims refused to get involved in printing presses. And the first printed copy of the Qur'an, 1537, Venice, Italy. Venice, once again Italy, and by the way Italy is the founder or is the, the bastion of the Renaissance, mainly because of the Muslim influence on Italy. Right? Dante's uh, Divine Comedy, for those of you who know Western culture, which is really the spark that really sparked the Renaissance, 1327 or so. Dante's Divine Comedy is basically adopted from the Isra wal Mi'raj, the whole concept of going up to the heavens and, and going down to hell and seeing what's happening. The whole Divine Comedy is an adaptation of a book that it's a modern, everybody knows now, I mean it's a well-known fact that the entire story has come from Muslim folklore and legend. And many other things can be shown to have a direct impact. However, truth be told, they took these kernels from the Muslims and then they allowed these kernels to grow and flourish. It is not fair to say that uh, the Muslims are uh, completely responsible for Renaissance. It is true to say they sparked it. It is true to say they sparked it. They, they allowed these sparks to come, but the, the geniusness cannot be denied. The Europeans did a lot to take from the Muslims and then take it to a different level. Getting back to the issue of the printing press, so the first Quran printed was in 1537, and the copies of this Quran, by the way, uh, we, for, the, for many centuries, we thought that no copies of this Quran had ever survived because it was so long ago. In 1980, uh, a private copy was discovered uh, by a collector in um, um, Florence in Italy and so we have a copy of this Quran uh, present now or else we had thought that it had completely been destroyed. The second uh, Quran to be printed was in 1694 in Hamburg 
by Abraham Hinkelman, a Yehudi who printed the Quran for the second time. And we have copies of this uh, in Germany. He printing the Quran in Germany. And the third is in Russia. Muslims, they're, they're, they've lost the plot. They don't want anything to do with the printing press. Now, as we said, the Jews and Christians established printing presses in Ottoman lands by 1520, 1540. Uh, they have private printing presses. But these are not in the language of the people. They're not in scholarly Turkish, in Ottoman Turkish. They're in their local dialects, and they are books that only the Christians and the Jews need to use. So these printing presses have no relevance to us in the broader scale of things. When was finally printing press introduced? Some thinkers were trying to get the printing press reintroduced and whatnot, and there were some ulama, there were some intellectuals who were arguing for the printing press. Perhaps the most famous of these was uh, a Hungarian convert to Islam by the name of uh, Ibrahim Muteferrika. Ibrahim Muteferrika, who in 1720, he is a Hungarian, he was born a Christian, and then he emigrated to the Ottoman lands, he converted to Islam, and he became a very high ranking minister, and he is a European. And he is now a converted Muslim, he's a pious Muslim, and he petitions the Grand Mufti that we need a printing press. 300 years after Gutenberg invented the printing press, finally the Grand Mufti is being told, wake up and smell the coffee. Coffee is another issue. Inshallah, one day we'll talk about coffee, inshallah. It's another interesting story. I'm not joking with you. Coffee is also a very interesting story of its experience with Muslim lands, but that's a whole different, uh, it's a whole different uh, ballpark. Um, so the Ibrahim writes a book that is called Wasilat al tibaa i.e. the printing press. Wasilat al tibaa how you print things, right? The printing press. Wasilat al tibaa And... He writes it by hand, of course, because he's not allowed to use a printing press or else he'd be executed. So he writes a book about the printing press, handwritten, okay? And he hands it to the Grand Mufti. And he argues in this book that one of the reasons why Europe is catching us up, footnote, not catching us up, has already caught us and surpassed us. But in 1720, the Ottomans were still blinded. In 1720, the Ottomans still think we're going to win, right? Later on, it's pretty obvious that around 1600, the decline began. Right? But this is hindsight is always 2020. We never know. I mean, this is easy for us to say now. But in 1720, the Ottomans still thought we're going to win, no problem. So Ibrahim uh, uh, Mutafarrika writes this book. He presents it to the Grand Mufti. He says the reason why the Muslims are in decline is because we don't have the printing press, because we're not educated, because this, that. So the Sultan, the Grand Mufti agrees. Alhamdulillah, you say Alhamdulillah, takbir. But they put three conditions. Condition number one. Nothing in Arabic. Condition number two, nothing to do with Islam. You're not allowed to print books of the religion. Print books of medicine, print books of history. No Islamic book of history, no Islamic book of tafsir, no Islamic book of hadith should ever be printed under penalty of death still. right? And condition number three, government approved list of books. Control is completely in the hands of the government. We don't want anybody to just go and do free inquiry. We need to approve the book cover to cover, stamp it before you're allowed to print it, right? SubhanAllah, I mean, even with these three conditions, at least the first printing presses are established, but these books are not going to change the Islamic psyche because they cannot have anything to do with Islam. But in 1726, a full 300 years after Gutenberg's uh, 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 printing press has been invented, and 300 years from now, right? This 300 years ago, I mean, to give you an understanding, there was no America in 1726, right? This is when, finally, the printing press is allowed for secular books, not in Arabic, i.e. not in the scholarly language. Remember, Arabic is the language of scholars. Every Turkish citizen knows Arabic. Every Turkish Ottoman, I should say Ottoman uh, citizen knows Arabic as the language of scholarship. You're not allowed to write in language, you're allowed to write in the vernacular, the Turkish vernacular, right? And it cannot be a book about religion. Now, to, to, to give you an idea basically of what we're talking about, by the time the printing press is introduced to Arab lands, places as far away as Tahiti, much less Mexico City, already have full up and running printing presses, right? There are printing presses in Hawaii, 
before there are printing presses in Damascus and Cairo. Understand this point, that the Muslim psyche of the time completely shut off the whole notion of there being free printing presses that are printing books of a, a normal nature. Now, when was this prohibition lifted? SubhanAllah, sadly, it wasn't even done by Muslims. Really sad. 1798, the first blatant act of colonialism occurs. Everybody should know this. What happens? Napoleon, Napoleon invades Egypt. The first act of... This is the beginning of colonialism, right? Why did Napoleon invade Egypt to this day people are writing books and, and, and theses about this and of course this is fundamentally problematic because you never try to rationalize Napoleon <laughs> you just assume Napoleon did things without a reason there's no reason why we can understand why Napoleon would invade Egypt uh, out of nowhere but that's what he did now when Napoleon invades Egypt this is the beginning of modernity for the Muslim world Wallahi, it is amazing to understand the Mamluk dynasty is still functioning when Napoleon invades the Mamluks, 700 years old, the Mamluks defeated, defeated the Mongols. These are the Mamluks, right? They're still living in that bubble. 700 years later, Napoleon finds people literally trying to oppose his forces, riding horses with bows and arrows. Literally, they have a few old guns, right? But that's it. And there is no question, Napoleon conquers all of Egypt in a week or two. That's a whole different history, we don't want to get there, maybe someday, inshallah. But one of the things Napoleon does, now whatever you want to say about Napoleon, this guy's forward thinking. On the ships that he brought with him to invade Egypt, there is a printing press. Imagine, I mean just imagine, you're invading a land, but you bring a printing press with you, right? And therefore, when he conquers Egypt, his printing press is established in Egypt and it becomes, under Napoleon's tutelage, the very first free printing, free printing meaning without government uh, uh, you know, uh, conditions, right? First printing press in Muslim lands under Napoleon Bonaparte. Isn't that sad? But that is the reality. That is the reality. So when Napoleon... Uh, leaves, he is forced to withdraw. Uh, similar, I mean, there's a lot of parallels maybe between modern Iraq and ancient uh, Egypt in that it's easy to conquer, but once you've conquered, the people don't want you there. You know, Afghanistan, you can conquer, but then what, right? So the people rejected, and Napoleon had to basically sneak out one night and disappear, which is what he did uh, as well. Uh, modern times as well, Iraq, they just had to leave. You can't really do anything with the people who don't want to rule you. When he leaves, he leaves the printing press there. And so the Muslims of the land break away from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Muhammad Ali Basha, all you Egyptians know the story from there. One of the reasons why Egypt becomes the pioneer of the Arab and Muslim world, not a coincidence, the printing press. One of the main reasons, and then Muhammad Ali Pasha's modernization is the second main reason. Or you can say the other way around, Muhammad Ali and then, uh, and then uh, the printing press. But the printing press has a lot to do with it. And therefore, the very first Islamic printing press that was established, finally, is in around 1870 or so. And it is called, who knows? Very, very famous, but academic, a Bulak printing press. I'll tell you. This is a Bulak printing press in a small village, Bulak, in Egypt. And to this day, by the way, I mean, uh, as you know, Alhamdulillah, I'm a scholar in this field, uh, Islamic field. The best books ever printed Islamically are the Bulak printing press books. Even though they're old and the typeset is old, but they're the most authentic and scholarly. Why? Because the people in charge were not businessmen, they were actual scholars. And so they edited ancient manuscripts and they d made the best editions of Sahih Bukhari, of Fath al-Bari, of Ibn Kathir. This is the Bulaq printing press, right? This is in 1860s, 1870s. As I said, by this time you have printing presses in Tahiti and in Hawaii. And I'm not, I'm not just making that up, literally. Tahiti and Hawaii, the small islands... And Hawaii was not a part of America back then. They have their printing presses up and running. Finally, the printing press is introduced in Qahira. And then after that, in Baghdad and in other Arab lands. Clearly, way after uh, uh, you know, things could have changed. Clearly, when the demise is basically well nigh, 40, 50 years after this, you know, in 19, uh, basically 15, after World War I, the Ottoman Empire is basically made symbolic. Uh, the Khilafah is made much like the Pope in the Vatican, just like you have a symbolic thing. Within six years, Atatur comes and he even abolishes this symbolic caliphate. All of this is not coincidental. All of this is not coincidental. 
the rise and eventual decline of paper and of the printing press is symptomatic. It gives us an indication of the rise and fall of the ummah. Now before we conclude, question arises, and this is really the question we need to be thinking about. Why did the Muslims oppose the printing press in the 1500s when they embraced paper a thousand years or 700 years before this? Why did this shift of mind? Well, clearly there are some small economic and practical reasons, and some scholars try to hype this up. Economic reasons. The secretaries and the kutab, the book scribes, are obviously going to lose their livelihood. And so they are petitioning against the printing press, right? Um, it is also said that uh, Arabic is a complex script, so to have letters that are all merging together, because you know, uh, Gutenberg didn't write in cursive. Gutenberg has block script, right? A, B, C, D, right? In the beginning was the word, you know, the Gutenberg Bible, Bible is still, we still have 30 copies of the Gutenberg Bible. The actual Bible that he, that he printed, we still have copies of them. These are individual letters, right? Arabic is not individual letters, right? Arabic has complex joinings and fonts and this and that. And when they finally did invent uh, Arabic printing presses in the 1800s, it is said that they had over 700 different, um, what do you call these small things? Basically the, um, the characters, there are 700 different things. Now, surely that might be a reason, but that's not the main reason. I mean, where there's a will, there's a way. If Muslims wanted the printing press, they would have devised something to figure out this script or do something about this. A main reason why the printing press was opposed was because Number one, it was assumed that this was a technology of the kafirs. And this is a fact. The Muslims became so arrogant and so proud that we rule the world, because they were at the top of the world, that when something came to them from outside of their lands, they said, no, no, this can't be better than us. We, we, we didn't do this, so there's got to be something wrong with this. right?" And so they became so deluded by their own accomplishments that they shut themselves off to external accomplishments. There was also another reason and that was a very scholarly reason and there's an element of truth to this. The scholars said, ulama, my class, unfortunately I had a big thing to do with this as well. They said, not only is this kafir, okay, that's, we all hear this as well. We, I'm, you, I'm purposely being mockful here because you know this is exactly what we hear to this day, right? The ways of the kuffars and dressing like the kuffar and imitating the kuffar. We still have this type of psyche left. But not only this, but we have another reason the scholars said. The scholars said, now this has a, a, a kernel of truth. They said, if we were to open printing press, we will dilute Islamic scholarship. How? Everybody will start reading. And you will have, let me be modern now, Mufti Wikipedia and Sheikh Google. <laughs> you see where we're coming here now, right? That if we open up the doors to the printing press, what's going to happen? You will read Sahih Bukhari, I will read Sahih Bukhari. You will read Ibn Kathir, I will read Ibn Kathir. What will I do as the Sheikh when you become Sheikhful as well? <laughs> you see what the point here, right? There's a power struggle. Which has happened, sah, bizzabt, which has happened to a level, to a level. Now, they had this concern that they wanted to keep the ijazah system. What is the ijazah system? I have Sahih Bukhari. This is it. You want it, there's only one way for you to get it. Come to me. I'll teach it to you. And you can copy my copy, and you recite it to me. I will say, so and so has mastered Bukhari. Yalla tafaddal, go teach Bukhari. You see, this is now, this is not coming out of thin air. There's an element of truth here, right? There's something that has made sense, that you want to keep scholarship high. Now, in our times, let's fast forward. We have Sheikh Wikipedia and Mufti Google, right? And we have plenty of people whose Isla entire Islamic education comes from the internet and cassettes and online. Let me be frank with you. You who have not studied Abroad, scholarly. Can you tell the difference between a real scholar and a Mufti Wikipedia scholar? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bashar, what do you say? Be honest with me. Yes, of course. Yes, you can. 
Now, perhaps some people cannot, and I understand. Yes, perhaps some people cannot. But somebody who has even a basic knowledge can instantaneously tell the difference between a quack and a real alim. Common sense, yani looking at some signs here and there, right? I'm not a doctor. I've said this a million times. I'm not a doctor. But wallahi, if somebody comes and gives me some fancy schmancy cure, I, yani I have some intelligence, right? I can tell a real doctor from, you know, a, a person who's a quack. You know, it's, it's something that requires a little bit of common sense, a little bit of knowledge of what medicine is. It's not, it is difficult for many, but it's not impossible. My point here, I know it's getting late, shall I five more minutes. My point here, if the scholars had adopted the printing press, and they had included and incorporated it into their system, they could have had their cake and eaten it too. They could have incorporated the best of both worlds, and they could have taken this and then made sure that some new system is done. But by shutting themselves off completely, what happened? SubhanAllah, in 1500, 1600, look at the, you can clearly see. Uh, yani in, there is a very simple chart some, some modern researcher has done. They're trying to show Europe and Islam and the Muslim world. And the, Europe is clearly at the bottom, Islam is clearly at the top. Around 1550 is when the two meet. Right? By 1600, the decline here begins and the rise there begins there. Right? And by 1800, which is when colonialism starts, another huge turn goes down, right? By eight, let's look at 1800. By 1800, the average Muslim has never read a printed book. The average Muslim has never seen a printed book because there's still the penalty of death, right? But by 1800, the average European, I mean, Charles Dickens is around this time, right? Look at where we are by 1800 versus where... Islamic lands are. And some people, Muslim and non-Muslim, have said, and this is simplistic, but wallahi, at one level I agree. Some people have said, if you had to blame the decline of the Muslims on one reason, it would be the printing press. And there's an element of truth to this. Because with the printing press comes what? Knowledge. And with knowledge comes what? Power. Every type of power, economic power, political power, religious power, every type of power. The printing press was so strong it destroyed the Catholic Church, right? The printing press was so strong it split Christianity into two. I mean, again, it's not a coincidence that Martin Luther had a printing press. And he printed his own Bible, right? It's not a coincidence. All of this, the, 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 the Renaissance and then the Reformation, these are the two main things that have formed the pre-modern world. Both of these are linked to the printing press. Right? So with the printing press comes power. And this power shook the foundations of Europe and made it a whole new world as it is now. We as Muslims shut ourselves off because of all of these reasons. And that's one of the reasons. Of course, there are also uh, spiritual reasons as well. Now, to conclude here, and again, I mean, the purpose of this was just to give you one, one lesson, right? The printing press and the, and the paper, just to see the difference, right? The paper and the printing press really shows psyche. And again, I reiterate for those who came late, I began this lecture by saying the rise and then the fall of the Muslims has clearly two elements to it. Number one, spiritual. Let's not ignore that. Very important, right? Iman has an immense role to play. And the printing press without Iman is also useless, right? But let's be honest here. Number two is also the Dunya, this world, knowing what this world is and embracing modernity even as you preserve your heritage. And unfortunately the Muslims in their complacency, in their whatever, they refuse to adapt to modernity. So modernity was shoved onto them and we're still in suffering from this phase. We still haven't fully adopted to modernity and I don't think we ever will but that is a whole uh, different point. Um, and I just want to conclude by... Uh, pointing out that you know, the main lesson that we learn from all of this, the main lesson that we learn, uh, again, before I conclude, all these things coming back to me, even the Sahaba, subhanAllah, the Sahaba, the Tabi'un, they were not in terms of worldly education at the pinnacle. Do you agree with me? Right? Worldly education. Astaghfirullah, don't ever misquote me. Iman and everything, the highest. They are the best of our ummah. Nobody ever misquote me. But I'm talking about in terms of the civilizational uh, areas of judgment, right? Of architecture, of literature. The Sahaba and Tabi'un had, had a different understanding. But they were willing to embrace and they were willing to adopt. And 
Umar ibn al-Khattab and others, when they conquered other lands, they had no problems that adopting to the local practices. Do you know that for the first 50 years of Islam, all of the dawaween and all of the, 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 the government documents were written in local languages by scribes that were not Muslims because the Sahaba understood, we don't know how to run an empire. We might have conquered the Byzantine to the Sassanids, but we don't know how to conquer, rule over you know, 100 million square miles. You understand this point? They knew this and they embraced this change. Many of the famous viziers of the early Abbasids and the early Umayyads were non-Muslims. And they didn't have a problem with that because they knew that we don't know yet. It was only in the late Umayyad time that the Umayyads finally made Arabic the national language. And they finally made their own currency. And they did. Before this time, the Sahaba had no problem adopting Roman currency, Persian currency, adopting Roman practices when it was not anything to do with the religion. And this is the inquisitiveness, the open mindedness that I'm talking about. They see paper, they see how useful it is, they embrace it, they change the world. A thousand years later, the printing press comes and said, no, 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 shut the world off. Right? And we're still suffering from this type of mentality now. Alhamdulillah, things are changing. Muslim mindsets are now becoming more open-minded. But we have two extremes, once again. We have these two extremes, going back to the beginning as well. The first extreme is to be so narrow-minded in the religion as to avoid any type of change whatsoever. Whatever inna wajadna aba'na ala ummatin wa inna ala thadihim muqtad. Whatever our father and grandfather did, that is Islam with a capital I. And you all know of these types of people. You all know of these types of fatwas, right? To this day, there are mosques in North America that do not allow women in their prayer spaces, correct? Because mosques back home don't have women. To this day, there are mosques in North America where the khutbah is given in some type of broken pseudo-Arabic that nobody in the audience understands. Why? Because we, find, we found our forefathers doing this, we're not going to change. Even if nobody understands, we're going to take a book and read this khutbah, and I don't care if nobody understands. Isn't this true? Right? You all know, and this is true, it's not a, it's not a myth. When the microphone was introduced, they said, we're not going to have the microphone in the masjid. You know, this is true. When the radio and television were introduced, this is all evil, we're not going to have it. Right? Well known. But you cannot fight world changes. You need to embrace them. So we have that ossified type of mindset. We're not going to change anything of the religion. Everything is the same. Pass it down. It's true we have the opposite extreme as well. And this is the extreme. They call themselves progressives, right? Everything goes. Whatever public society says should also be a part of Islam. No gender segregation at all. Same-sex marriages. This, not, Whatever is popular should also be made into Islam. You, these are two extremes, right? As usual, the truth is in the middle. And this is no doubt a difficult field. And it requires scholarship and an open-mindedness. Unfortunately, and I'll be frank here because inshallah I am of the scholarly class, clergy class, many of our fellow scholars are not open-minded enough. Many of the open-minded intellectuals are not scholarly enough and not Islamic enough. And this, was, this is the problem that we're happening. Many of our scholars don't want that side. Many of the reformists don't want this side. Right? And so there's this huge clash and tension that we have between these two ranks of people. As usual, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Scholars who are open-minded should lead the change. They should tell us where the line is to be drawn. And they should tell us where uh, uh, something should be allowed. Final point, you all will say, how is it possible that the scholars did not approve of the printing press? Let me give you a controversial example that inshallah ta'ala, I hope to implement someday. But I don't want any of you to implement. If I were to do this now, many of you would object. Right? But this is an example that I have thought about for many years. And I'm very firm, inshallah, about. But please don't do so without some scholarly backing. Uh, I'm just giving you as a theoretical example. In my humble opinion, not only should the khutbah be given in English, not only should we use the microphone, we should also have PowerPoints for the khutbah. We should have PowerPoints. Where? Where the khatib is, there should be two blank walls in the khutbah time. I should be clicking as I go along. And you should be following along with me because the purpose of the khutbah is what? Just to pay attention and get it, right? And one of the best ways to get this information is basically by visual. You all know by visual you learn more. What is wrong with having a PowerPoint during the khutbah? Think about it, right? Now, for many of you, it's the same thing. 
that and wallahi if i were to do this i would get a huge backlash from people all over the world a'udhu billah bid'a kafir you know this I'm, you know this is true right you know this is true right there will be automatic khutbah once. <laughs> People are going to say, if you open the printing press, this will happen. They're going to say this as well. That if you're going to allow PowerPoint, what next? Just have a, a, a video for the khatib then. They're going to say that. But no, we say the scholar is going to draw the line. We need a live khatib in presence, right? The PowerPoint has to be conforming to these conditions. We have, but the scholar should lead the change, right? And inshallah, when we build our MIC center, Dr. Bisha, I will suggest and petition the board that we take the lead in this, insha'Allah. And we have PowerPoints already installed and ready for the khatib to be using while he's giving the khutbah. I don't know if the, I don't know if the board's going to approve or not, right? But, but, why not now? Because we don't have a nice wall for it, that's why. You'll fix that, insha'Allah. <laughs> but I will be the, the Ibrahim Pasha who's writing the letter. And I was saying, open your minds. Be realistic here. You know what I'm saying? We need this type. Now, this is a type of change. I guarantee you that somebody's going to do it first. If we don't do it, somebody's going to do it, right? And if somebody does it without conditions, without scholarship, yani we don't want it to go too far. The scholar should lead the change with the proper Islamic conditions, right? And that's where the bottom point that I want all of you to really go away with is. Be open-minded about your religion and about the modern world. Understand the limitations of the clergy class and of the intellectuals and progressives. Realize that Allah sent this religion down to be applied at every time and every place and every location. And Allah allowed for some change to occur. And had He not allowed for that change, Islam would never have spread from Alaska to China, from Australia, although it wouldn't have spread if Allah had not allowed for some change, right? And so inshallah ta'ala, we hope that by this small history of paper and the print, shed some light about this. I ask Allah's refuge if I made any mistake or if I said anything that offended anybody. I know these are difficult topics for many of us to, uh, to swallow. But inshallah, I hope that as we continue along, we will educate the ummah more and more about some of the pitfalls that we face so that we don't have to face them again. I know I went over time, just two, three minutes of questions, and inshallah, we'll pray Salat al-Isha. Yes. The printing is much easier to do. There is PowerPoint. There is PowerPoint. So he's saying there is in Damascus. Khalas. So we have precedent. Khalas. <laughs> so the question is, uh, in the Quran, there is like ayat, uh, that the kitab will arrive at me. Yes. The word kitab, is it, like you said, uh, the binding, the binding. No, the structure of the kitab was not mentioned in the book. In the Quran, it doesn't mention. I am saying the structure of the modern book to have two flaps as a cover, to have a sewn binding, and then to have another flap on the side, which these days we don't have that flap. You know what I'm talking about? The, the Arabs here would know, even Pakistanis, you have this flap of the Quran. Right? In the old days, they had a flap on both sides. One of them was full and the other was something you could use. This structure was invented by the Muslims 8th, 9th century. Before this, uh, the, the Prophet never had a bound Qur'an. Uh, and the earliest Qur'an, the, the Qur'an of Abu Bakr was called a Mus'haf. And a Mus'haf, it was called a Mus'haf because a Mus'haf means a collection of papers, not bound. Collection of Sahifa, Suhuf, right? A Mus'haf was an, a term used for the first Qur'an because it was not bound. So the structure of a bound book with covers was not known to the Sahaba. I guess the question is, where is the word Kitab? Kitab, as we know it now, it means the book. No, but I said, what did the Muslims do? The binding and the covers. So it's a, a, it's a, a book doesn't have to be with bindings and with covers or with a flap. You have a collection of papers, this is a book, right? But you didn't have the bound book. This is what the Muslims uh, invented later on. Not a collection of, of scrolls or a collection of, yani even the Mus'haf of Abu Bakr, how was it? I told you, we have a copy of the Quran that's huge. It's not bound. It's papers and you just pick up one paper, put it here and look at the other paper. That was called a kitab, right? But it wasn't bound on one side. This is the difference, okay? Sisters, any questions? Go ahead. You, you talked about paper and the printing press and how important it was. Arguably, the advent of the internet is as important. Arguably, indeed. So the question is, 
question that I have is, what is your assessment, briefly, of how the Muslims are harnessing that technology and where are we lacking in how we're handling the internet? Uh, firstly, an announcement. There is a Mercury license plate 910FK3. Uh, the light is left on. It's not on fire. It's the, the light is left on. Your battery is going to die out. So there's a Mercury Milan. Uh, the internet. This is another major, major technological advancement of our times. Not just the internet, but also, uh, but also the the television, the media, satellite channels. All of this clearly. The Muslims have not utilized it to the level it should, but at least because there is no government control over all Muslim lands, individual Muslims have embraced the idea, right? Still though, uh, Muslim satellite channels are way behind. Look at here in America. We still don't have a single successful satellite channel. Even though there is, I mean, sad to say, Arabic rap channels, Pakistani music channels, right? Indian Bollywood video channels, right? But we don't have a successful Islamic channel in all of North America. We have attempts, but nothing that is professional and to that level. Same applies for the internet. There are many good attempts here and there. And overall, alhamdulillah, I mean, it's, I would say the internet, because there's individual efforts and you don't need millions of dollars, an average person can dedicate a good amount of time and produce a good website. But still, the internet can be utilized more. But this is where, again, the job is for individuals with the passion, the expertise, the technical know-how to get involved and to then utilize the modern printing presses to bring about the change. Okay. The Arab Spring is almost entirely related to the internet. The Arab Spring is all the result of Facebook and Twitter. Yes. Without Facebook, there could not have been the Arab Spring. Yes. Go ahead. The question is about when initially when the, uh, it was then so called Haram to have a printing press. And we understand the reason given that uh, they don't want to do the power and all that. But what was the religious reasoning given? The religious reasoning given was twofold. Number one, the scholars wanted their power, which was some legitimacy that we don't want to open up knowledge. Number two, they said that it's not dignified for the Quran to be printed or Islamic books to be printed. You sh it should be, done. why not? Because we're used to this. But for them, a Muslim scribe, ala tahara, you know, with wudu, he writes the Quran, you know, he feels religious while he's doing it. You know, if you were to do this, what are you going to do? A kafir can just turn the switch on and all the Quran is being printed. It feels sacrilegious, right? So they felt a sense of, and I'm not saying this is completely incorrect, there is a sense of a righteous Muslim writing the Quran with his hand and getting reward for that. Religious books, then overall religious books. That's why they allowed eventually in 1726, they said what? Basically kafir books okay, Islamic books not okay. Right? Because we don't want Islamic books to be printed with the printing press. Okay? Oh, we're going a bit too late. I don't want to delay Isha for... Quick question. Like, um, I mean, we, you know, like you said, Islam did rule the world. You know, and uh, with, with so many scholars, so many smart people, how did nobody predict that, hey, if we don't have books, these guys, these, you know, Christian guys, Jewish guys, they're reading all these books. Some people did predict it, but too late. As I said, Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim Mutarifik in, in 1720, he's the one who said that unless we do something, they're going to outpace us. You see what I'm saying? You're saying way down here and there. But again, I agree with you now, but hindsight is 2020, right? Looking back, it's so easy to say, why didn't we do this, why didn't we do that? Believe me, if somebody were to ask you now, how come to this day so many Muslim lands have tyrannical regimes? How come it took so long for the Arab Spring? You know? And I'm saying Arabs, how about my own land of Pakistan and others? How come we're so backward in corruption? I mean, wake up, what's going on? Can't we say the same thing of our people? Ignorance and it, it is so it's not it's well that's true a lot of it does go back to the printing press issue yeah, it's like, like, I mean, even today you know in, in a lot of those lands I mean I'm from Bosnia but you know people don't read books it's like what you hear oh what well, you know this guy told me this and he's an expert so he must know you know without checking any of the information, and that's what it is. That's what the yeah, it's true to say that Europe developed what we call the scientific mind of inquiry. It is generalization, but it's true to say that they, even in school, in this land, we are taught to question. 
Allah. You know, we're taught to, but in our lands we're not taught. We're just taught to hear and obey the authorities and rulers. I mean, being generic here, but there's an element of truth to this. Allahu alam. Then actually, just like, like with the PowerPoint, I'm an educator. I use PowerPoint every single day. I don't see what's wrong with that. Like, how I don't see what's wrong with it either. I can guarantee you, because you I can guarantee you the first scholar in North America or in most you're saying this is in Damascus, Akhi, but it's not common, right? Yeah, just one. Yeah, I, yani the first person to make this public, he is going to face fatwas of uh, innovation, of this and that. I mean, believe me, I'm in that world. I know. I know this is going to happen. Okay? So, uh, yani, inshallah, I'm hopeful MIC will... Uh, We'll be brave, but it's up to the board of MIC. Again, we're just giving our advice from outside, you know, and doing this, inshallah.